you know, I, as I was reading the book, I kept thinking, how close are we to this being the George B. McClellan bookshop? Yes. Uh, so I was, <laughs> I was worried as I kept going through this that maybe things are going to change in the end. Um, what were the various schemes of taking over the administration? Uh, what were the sources of conspiracy, uh, mm -hmm. if there was conspiracy, or at least the thoughts of? How prevalent were they? Uh, who were the players behind them? The political players, especially, that McClellan had to be looking at, because it wasn't all military. Right. Uh, and many of them stepped away from them. Uh, so certainly there was the, you know, uh, not beat the enemy crowd. Yes. Well, there's uh, McClellan b b becomes, almost by default, the symbolic leader of the Democratic Party. Um, when the South secedes, the whole Southern leadership of the party goes. Stephen A. Douglas, the leader of the Northern Democrats, dies in the first year of the war. And there's really no national figure uh, for the party. And, and McClellan is the highest placed Democrat, uh, I guess until Stanton takes over as Secretary of War, um, uh, in the government. And so he becomes a kind of democratic voice within the president's councils. And McClellan feels that he is responsible for keeping the administration on what he calls a conservative course. That is a course that would be approved by the Democratic Party. His contacts in New York are a guy named William Aspinwall uh, and uh, Sam Barlow, who are both the leaders, that with, uh, along with August Belmont, are the leaders of the New York City um, wing, let's call it, of the, uh, of the Democratic Party. And those are his political patrons and his political advisors. And uh, uh, his, uh, he, he gives up on the idea, the idea of a congressionally sanctioned dictatorship fades. Uh, but the situation is such that if McClellan can, if B McClellan believes that if he can force Lincoln to fire Stanton as Secretary of War, and, and then a little bit later on fire Halleck as General in Chief, then McClellan would have done two things. He would then be the highest military advisor that the president had. And by the very fact of having forced Lincoln to do that, he would have established his political and moral ascendancy over Lincoln, who, as I said, he regards as a weakling. And that's his goal. And to reach that goal, what he does uh, is, um, that is the overt actions that he does, is he runs a campaign in the press through correspondents that are following the army around, and also by having officers like Fitz John Porter correspond secretly with the editors of the two big anti-administration papers in New York. The New York World, edited by Manton Marble, which is the Democratic Party's sheet, and the independent uh, but anti-administration uh, New York Herald, James Gordon Bennett. And what McClellan's officers are doing is uh, St St Stanton sabotaged the army. Stanton deliberately starved McClellan of reinforcements. He wanted McClellan to be defeated. And that's, that's the treason of Stanton. Uh, and uh, while the, all of this press campaign occurs, while McClellan's army is being shifted away from, Rich, from Richmond and John Pope's army is maneuvering against Lee, he, instead of supporting Pope, he's working against Pope and against Stanton through the, uh, discrediting them through the, uh, the press. And that's his way throughout. His main instrument of actual action is the press. Um, we keep talking about Stanton. They were both Democrats yes. before the war yes. and, and even into it. Uh, and, I, you know, uh, McClellan must have thought it was Camelot when yes. Stanton got into the Secretary of yes. Warship. Uh, but things changed, and yes. this friendship came apart. How yeah. did that happen? Well, it, it, it's, that's really fascinating because uh, they, it, it's the phrase that Lincoln was the original guerrilla was actually Stanton's, Stanton's. although uh, McClellan, in, in a sense, makes it his own. Um, Stanton is very hard to figure. Uh, I think the best that one can say of him is he's a passionate uh, Union man, and once he becomes Secretary of War, he sees that McClellan is, is delaying operations and delaying active engagement with the enemy. And as Secretary of War, he sees how bad that is. Um, it may also be that he used McClellan to get into the position uh, because his he's also an extremely 
ambitious man. And then the thought also occurred to me that he was the kind of guy who not only could never forgive an injury, but could never forgive a favor either. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, uh, for all, personality and politics, he turns against McClellan, and he turns like that. It's a matter of weeks mm -hmm. after taking office that he becomes McClellan's uh, strongest critic, most effective critic in the administration. Now, in the administration, there was a backer, wasn't there not? Uh, Montgomery Blair? Montgomery Blair, yes. And how, what was that relationship? Uh, well, well, Blair represents um, the, the most conservative element of the Republican Party. And uh, the Blairs are, uh, they're not pro, they're, they're against slavery in the sense that they know that slavery has to be destroyed if the South is going to be beaten. But they are absolutely committed to white supremacy. And there's a, a good quote from uh, Montgomery Blair. Uh, it's for, uh, from a later period in the 1864 uh, election where he's, uh, he's trying to get the Democrats to, to come on board with the administration. Uh, to pre uh, His phrase is to preserve this exclusive right of government in the white race. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's a pro-McClellan guy, because McClellan uh, is, is, is a white supremacist. And whatever McClellan does or doesn't do about slavery is going to preserve white supremacy. And so the Blairs are, um, in a sense, they represent the, the wave of the future in American politics because the slavery issue, in a sense, overrides the racial issue for a lot of people. And once Lincoln strips away the slavery issue with uh, Emancipation Proclamation, there it is. Okay, you were against slavery. You thought it was immoral. You thought it was uneconomic, whatever. You wanted it done with. And now that you're done with it, now you look at a multiracial nation. What are you going to do about it? Mm. Are you for racial equality? Who's for racial equality in the 1860s? Not that many people. If you're for white supremacy, on what basis? What's your rationale for it? How are you going to do it? Uh, nobody knows, but the Blairs are interested in preserving that, and that's why they like McClellan. Uh, we're jumping around a little bit here. Yeah, sure. McClellan in, in 64, running for president, uh, stepped away from the Democrat, the Democratic plank, had his own peace plan. What was that peace plan that he envisioned? Yeah, McClellan, um, uh, well, actually, he puts out a, during the, 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 it's in the book, he, uh, uh, in the interval after the Emancipation Proclamation is issued, um, he is actually asked to, by his Democratic advisor to say, what would his policy be if he got the kind of control within the Lincoln government that he was aiming for? And he said, well, actually, he didn't say it. Fitz John Porter <coughs> says it. He, said, he says, McClellan would establish a conservative reign. He uses that royal kind of word. And the first act would be to uh, rescind the president's absurd proclamation. Uh, so uh, when McClellan runs for president, the thing he opposes is an armistice with the Confederacy, which would have given the Confederacy independence, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is against the proclamation, uh, and uh, he doesn't say anything about the planks that called for re-enslaving blacks freed by the act, by the, uh, by the proclamation. And some, some Democrats were calling for black soldiers. Yeah. Well, we, we'll get into that when we get yeah. to the Emancipation yeah. Proclamation. Sure. I, one thing I want to ask you about, too, is then, you know, we do know that it didn't take place. Yes. And McClellan didn't take over the administration. Um, Fremont, of course, tried yes. at one point yes. as well. Yes. He had an idea, toyed with the idea, and he backed away. Fremont, McClellan, backing away from these things, is it, I'm hoping it is, but I'm asking yeah. you, is it because democracy in, in the republic is so ingrained in the American psyche that when they got to the point where they may have done it, they just could not do it because yes. it was against themselves? No. I think, though, that uh, what they recognize is that the people will not support it. Now, I can't speak so certainly about, uh, about Fremont. I haven't studied him in that day. But with McClellan, uh, in, uh, we're, we're shifting ground here, but in, in the period after... The, um, the, the proclamation comes out. McClellan sends a note to Aspinwall, his advisor, uh, which, and, and it, it's a diff his letters to Aspinwall before this are very informal and friendly. This reads like a campaign document. Uh, I wonder what you and people like you think 
about the president's uh, uh, at one stroke uh, to abolishing constitutional government and turning the United States into a despotism. And that's his, declar that's his opinion of the, the proclamation and the habeas corpus uh, acts. And that's a, that's a radical statement to, to accuse Lincoln of establishing a despotism because the remedy for a, a, a despot is revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's asking his advisors how far they're willing to go. And what they tell him is they're not willing to go very far at all. In fact, they say, we'd rather you didn't say anything. Because they're democratic politicians. They're looking at uh, 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 victories in the midterm elections. And uh, everyone outside McClellan's little circle of advisors that he speaks to, and he then speaks to people outside his circle, tell them, the army won't support you. Uh, uh, General Cox says, um, the, the, the officers in this army are civilian soldiers and more civilian than they are soldiers. Mm -hmm. And they will never support you in something like this. They love their country. They love, their, they love democracy. They're not going to back you on this. Lincoln certainly didn't feel that the soldiery no. Would, no. would back something like this. No, but, but, he, but he was leery of the uh, McClellan and his officers. Well, and that's the adulation of him yeah. by the soldiers. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that should have worried Lincoln a bit. And he said, as he said, when he visited the army, uh, this is not the Army of the Potomac. This is uh, General right. McClellan's bodyguard. Yeah. And again, that's again to a to a classically educated America. That's a reference to the Praetorian Guards of Rome that overthrew the emperors. Um, uh, there's a reporter for the Herald in McClellan's camp at this time, and he says um, the the talk in the army is of. Uh, Throwing, uh, throwing out, uh, in, washing on washing, throwing out incumbents and making a change of dynasty is the way that he puts it. Uh, large prospects of a great revolution. And uh, uh, in spite, and uh, the last element though, is not simply that the people are opposed to such thing, but Lincoln knows it. And Lincoln plays his hand against Fremont and against McClellan with confidence that the people will back him. Uh, and so he goes to McClellan's camp. In a sense, he says, okay, you know, here I am. Mm -hmm. uh, I me, walk all among you, here, here I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, in the book, I compare McClellan, uh, in, uh, uh, Lee's treatment of McClellan with Lincoln's treatment of McClellan. Each one of them knew <clears throat> that McClellan was a, a guy who could load the gun but not pull the trigger. And uh, McClellan, Lincoln, Lincoln walks the political line with McClellan, Lee walks the military line. And they